Dorothea asked me um, to begin um, maybe by telling you a little bit more about uh, the mathematician that Sam mentioned, Max Dane. Um, before I do that, though, I wanted to uh, just step back a bit and um, say how this conversation started. Um, it started uh, quite a while ago. It's been going on for almost a decade. Um, our friend, mutual friend, uh, Julie Martin um, of Experiments in Art and Technology, who, who's here tonight, um, introduced me to Dorothea, and I got to know her a little bit better um, the following year when I curated an exhibition, um, a show, um, with Alex Whitney at David Zwerner Gallery um, that included a work uh, set, which we'll look at, I think, later on. And that show um, had the title, <laughs> Proofs and Refutations. Um, it came from uh, the title of a book um, by a philosopher of mathematics uh, named Imre Lakatos. And uh, that, the goal of that, that book was to investigate uh, informal mathematics, informal mathematics, um, as a way to aid uh, people in understanding the logic of working in situations, or what he called a, a heuristic. Uh, and so the, the show tried to bring together um, artists who work with a kind of situation and in a dynamic way, and included um, people like Trisha Brown and uh, Dan Graham and Bruce Nauman, uh, again with Dorothea Rockburn. Uh, and it was, it's been a pleasure to continue um, talking with her ever since. Um, right now I'm working on a chapter for a, a collaborative biography of Max Dane um, that's uh, being organized by uh, Marjorie Seneschal from Smith College uh, Emerita. And this chapter that I'm working on is really looking at the end of Dane's life when he was teaching at Black Mountain College um, with uh, people like Joseph and Ani Albers. And the project is a collaboration with Brenda Danilovitz um, from the Albers Foundation. So um, some of the things that I'm going to show are coming from, from that research. Um, so did you want to maybe say a little bit, Dorothea, about your aims for the evening, or should we dive right in? Uh, yes, I would like to say a little something about that. Uh, <clears throat> I'm very aware that most people, most artists in particular, are terrified of math. And I have had a different experience, which I'd like to mention. Um, and it's, it's uh, interwoven with my art experience. When I was a child, um, I was sick as a child, and I made watercolors. And from those watercolors, I realized that I derived more information on more levels than any book that up to that date I had read. I could read early. And it struck me that by painting, I was able to tap a part of myself that I really didn't know, couldn't know any other way. And I just put that aside and pursued art, as we know. But then, when I went to Black Mountain and met Max Dane, I encountered the same thing in mathematics. Max was a beautiful man, incredibly beautiful man, and beautiful mind and spirit and incredibly generous. And he sort of took me under his wing because I didn't know any mathematics. And I don't think I was prejudiced or anything, but I, it never crossed my mind to know any more than this mattering that I knew. And he, he brought me into the fold, and he showed me the beauty of mathematics as it related, first of all, to plants and trees, and then to the universe. 
And I wanted to talk with Philip tonight because he has the same, he's the closest person to Max that I've ever met, closest mathematician. And uh, I, I would like to help you dispel your fears and to learn the beauty of this form of thinking, which is really parallel to art thinking. OK, so um, maybe we can take a look at some of Max Dane's pictures. Um, Dane uh, is really well known in mathematics, and especially in topology. Um, and geometry, which is kind of the area that I, I studied. Um, he was, just to give you a little background, so um, this is a picture from him, uh, of him at Black Mountain College with Tony Dane. Um, he was a hiker, and I'm sure Dorothy will talk about um, his uh, love of botany and nature and how that was a part of his teaching practice. Um, but just to give you some frame of reference, um, he's born in Hamburg in 1878, um, and he studied at University of Göttingen, which was one of the main centers of mathematics in Europe at the time, if not the world. Uh, at, uh, in 1901, he publishes the paper On Volume, with a stunningly short title, On Volume, uh, at the age of 22 or 23, um, and in doing that, solved a, uh, the first of a set of problems that uh, uh, shaped the 20th century mathematics. They're called the Hilbert problems. Um, and then he um, is also responsible for writing the first uh, systematic treatment of geometric topology. Um, with Paul Haygard in 1907. Um, he married Tony in 1912. Um, one of the, the first results that I learned about, which is almost um, poetic and also its simplicity, was to prove that there are two trefoil knots. Um, so I'll show you some pictures and talk about that. Um, that was in 1914. After his military service, um, he assumed the chair of pure and applied mathematics at the University of Frankfurt, um, but was forced um, uh, to resign in 1935 um, as a Jew in Nazi Germany. Um, he stayed quite long, actually, in Europe. He had uh, in, in Germany and in Europe, um, and before eventually fleeing to the United States in 1940. And he, after teaching in a few different institutions, he was at Black Mountain um, from 1945 until he died in, in I'd 1952. I'd like to mention something about Max, and that is that um, he was arrested on Kristallnacht. And he and thousands of other people were taken to jail. And they had a very comfortable life, had had a very comfortable life, and a life that was mathematically intellectual. And also, the, he had a great love of music. He, he played an instrument um, all the time. And uh, Twenty went to, uh, she just took all, everything she could, and she pawned it. And she got him out of jail. She bribed the guards. They had no, they just, they had no preparation for the Nazis for what they did. They had all these people nowhere to put them, so they were happy to get the money and, and get rid of them. Uh, and from there. Yeah, that's a totally fascinating story. Yes. And I don't know if it was on another occasion that he was arrested, well, brought in to the station and um, the sergeant on duty, um, when he arrived, told the officer that, that it was past 5 p.m. and he should know not to bring anyone after hours. Um, and mm -hmm. so he was sent, he went back home and, and Tony, the story I heard, was standing in the same spot when she had seen him taken away um, and then they fled immediately um, by a 
by an amazing route um, across Russia, um, not, not across the Atlantic. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to show you some pictures um, from Dane's work um, because I think there's, um, they're, they're, they're pretty striking. And um, like mathematical diagrams, they, they're kind of uh, ornamented with lots of different symbols and so on. Um, but they're, I think they're strong enough that you can still tell a story about them um, even without knowing the details. Um, so this is from his 1914 paper, uh, The Two Trefoils. And um, I'm showing you just one for now. Uh, the mathematical knot is, is uh, I think, is a good name for it. It's um, a good model of it is, is what you tie in, in your shoelaces, uh, except that uh, the knot is an unending um, loop. And so you would somehow have to glue the, or sew the ends of your shoelaces together um, to get a, mo a model of a math knot. Um, and anyway, so what we're looking at, there are lots of loops here, but mainly um, the tube uh, sort of thickened up um, trefoil there uh, is, has a particular orientation of over and under. And um, if you're tying your shoelaces, most people start with uh, I don't know, I, I was, it was called a granny knot <laughs> when I was learning to do it. Um, but there's actually two ways to do it, and I've never noticed that. Um, and if you take its reflection, so I, this is not his diagram, I just took the mirror image of his diagram, um, you get a slightly different arrangement, um, which you can maybe see the difference by looking at the first fattened crossing there, kind of in the upper left just to the right of that A1. Um, I'd like to interrupt you again, because yeah. <laughs> I know I'm talking to an art audience. The important thing about knots is how they cross over and where they cross over. And we, incidentally, are all made from knots, and so is the universe. <laughs> <laughs> and also, he Max did a book. Uh, I did a class at Black Mountain, which which, unfortunately, he wasn't teaching that when I was there, but it was called Geometry for Artists. Yeah. Um, and it's good you mentioned the universe, because um, so you see these, these loops that are labeled A um, with a different subscript. They're kind of going into the picture, into the depth of the space, and looping around parts of the knot. And that's really one of the main reasons that knots are so interesting mathematically, um, not only because of their diagrams, which are attractive um, for a lot of reasons, but they, uh, so a knot doesn't contain space exactly, right? It's just a curve. Um, but what it does is it, it does separate paths in space. So um, if you think of a simple loop, um, you can pass through that loop and around it some number of times in different directions. Once you have a loop that's knotted, it creates a kind of multiple door through space. And um, yeah, some people, uh, so one of the important algebraic tools for understanding them is, is kind of how many and how differently um, these paths through space are. Anyway, um, studying that algebra, um, here's his diagram of the mirror image. Um, he was able to prove that um, even it, taking infinite amount of time rearranging uh, the configuration of, of this loop, um, that you could never get it to be its mirror image. Um, and that's one of the first results in uh, what's now opened up a whole field in knot theory. And it really wasn't until 1984, um, many decades later, that, uh, that mathematicians have a had a tool that could prove this very quickly. So his work is, this paper, um, is something that people are still really interested in. So that's one idea. I mentioned the paper on volume. Um, this is a diagram from it. Um, it's maybe surprising that mathematicians uh, are able to discover new things about an idea that seems as fundamental as volume. 
Um, and what he did um, answered a very ancient question, a very old and ancient question. Um, the notion of area in Euclid um, and volume was a kind of discrete idea in that two things had the same volume. If you could cut one into pieces and rearrange them into the um, exact shape of another. Um, so we call this scissor congruence. Um, and there was a, this is a Euclid, I, I knew that um, you could do this for any two polygons that are the same area. If you take a, a square and you take a, a rectangle that's the same area but with different proportions, um, there's actually a construction of how to divide it, dissect it, and rearrange it. But the question of whether that's true for volume um, had, was unsolved until Dane. Um, so centuries later, he showed that uh, it's not the case, that there are two polyhedra, kind of generalization of a polygon, that um, are the same volume, um, actually two pyramids. Um, he gave in a concrete example um, that you can't slice in uh, finitely many cuts and rearrange. Um, and that, that kind of established his international reputation. Um, it was helpful that it was one of Hilbert's problems, and Hilbert was his advisor. <laughs> it's not clear if he kind of so knew. Explain who Hilbert is. Yeah, sorry, David Hilbert. Um, uh, was. He was one of the, so he was the chair of the um, math department uh, at Göttingen. Um, and he's kind of thought of as one of the last people who had a complete understanding of all areas of math, kind of had this grasp of algebra and geometry and number theory and calculus and but different. So he equations. was controversial. Um, yeah, he had a. Th uh, he's often associated with a formalist approach to mathematics, and he, he's kind of he's quoted as saying that um, uh, if you change all the words in. Uh, in a proof um, so that it doesn't say points and lines and planes. It says uh, beer mugs and tables and chairs. It makes no difference to me. Um, he, so he, had the, he advanced this really modern idea that uh, math isn't, isn't about things, and it's really about um, setting up interesting rules and seeing where they go. And, um, uh, the truth is a little more rich, as you'd expect. He, he also wrote um, a book, co-authored a book called Geometry um, and Intuition, um, which uh, I, th I think Dane probably gave and taught from mm -hmm. to a lot of his students. Um, that word intuition we might talk about a little bit more. Um, so yeah, David Hilbert had a, had a huge uh, impact on 20th century math. Um, and Dane was one of his students. It still does have an impact. To Absolutely, this day. yeah. It's one of, that book is one of my Bibles. <laughs> um, lastly, I just wanted to to mention that he his work is not only um, in geometry. Um, so I, I mentioned this these kind of loops and that there's an algebra of those loops. Um, that algebra that object is called a group. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's kind of a fundamental object in doing mathematics. But um, even there, Dane brought a geometric intuition. So this is a picture of, of a group, what he called a group image, um, a group and build. And it has, and he exploited the symmetries that he found among these, um, these abstract relations between the elements of a set. Um, and he was able to use this to great effect. Um, in this paper, uh, he was working on a, right, so the Poincaré conjecture was um, one of. Uh, Say who Poincaré was. Yeah, Henri Poincaré. Uh, yeah, and anybody else to uh, please uh, <laughs> just raise a hand. Uh, if, if you have a question, we can stop. Uh, he was maybe. Uh, the counterpart to Hilbert, in a sense, but centered in Paris. Um, also a geometer of, um, who was extremely prolific. And um, he 
discovered um, the real, yeah, there are a lot of things he can, <laughs> I, I'd like to say, um, but one of them anyway, was recognizing that this algebraic object is really useful for distinguishing all kinds of three-dimensional spaces that you might want to use to build a model in physics um, or study um, solutions to equations. And he put forward a, a conjecture um, that characterized um, somehow the, one of the simplest possible three-dimensional spaces. It's the analogy of a circle or a sphere, but in three dimensions. And uh, everybody set to work on it, um, but it, it lasted uh, through the end of the century. Um, and in the spirit of Hilbert's problems from 1900, the 23 problems, the Clay Foundation in Massachusetts announced a set of millennium problems in 2000. And there were only seven. I don't know why they were not as ambitious. I think it was maybe because they advertised the problem through the prize money, which was a million dollars. So you might have heard about these million dollar problems. Anyway, the only one that's been solved um, is the Poincaré conjecture. So uh, Gregory Perelman solved in 2003, and it's a totally fascinating story that was in the New Yorker and the New York Times and um, because of the, uh, the characters involved. But um, that was Poincaré. Dane tried working on the Poincaré conjecture. Um, he didn't solve it, but he, uh, he did an enormous amount of uh, work and progress, and this was uh, from published in this paper. Um, so, yeah, question. Right, um, volume is uh, the measure of a three-dimensional quantity of space. Uh, area is a measure of the two-dimensional or surface area space, measure of space. I just wanted to point out also that um, Dane had a lot of other interests. Um, he was described by André Veil, uh, André Vey, a, a French mathematician, uh, also happens to be the brother of Simone Vey, um, that he was a humanistic mathematician who saw mathematics as, as one chapter, certainly not the least important in the history of human thought. And um, after Dane uh, assumed the chair of Pure and Applied Math in Frankfurt, he set about study, starting a seminar on the history of mathematics. And it was a very simple premise. Uh, they would read in the original language um, classic texts um, and discuss them. Um, unfortunately, uh, they didn't, the goal was not to publish. I mean, it's unfortunate and fortunate. Um, the idea was, was to have a, a substantive conversation without kind of the drive to publish, I think. Um, at least that's what me, and as, a <laughs> as a 20th century mathematician, I'm like, um, admire especially about it. Um, but he did publish um, on his thoughts about the philosophy of mathematics, in particular, the way that mathematics happens. Um, so in 32, Mathematics and Man, in 36, Space, Time, and Number, in Aristotle from a Mathematical Point of View. Both of those were published in a, an Italian uh, journal called Scientia um, that also published uh, Einstein and um, other um, scientists who were thinking very broadly about the impact of their work. Then on Ornamentation in 1940, and then this seemed to be culminating in a work that he didn't finish um, on the psychology of mathematical activity. And Dane's conception of mathematical activity was that it was a part of the human spirit um, that was on the same range uh, as music and visual art and architecture um, and he talked about actually like the geometric heart and other organs um, as if they had resonance with 
mathematical thinking um, and I guess attitudes or um, modes of thinking. And he presents this in a kind of building up since we just talked about dimension um, in the difference between area and volume, he thought about it um, first as a conception of rhythm um, and that this kind of awakens a sensibility um, that can be generalized from maybe not only hearing but making marks on a, on a, on a clay va uh, pot and impressions like on this uh, Neolithic um, vase here to um, a two-dimensional notion of rhythm which uh, he identified with polyrhythms or um, actually with polyphony um, as well as the arrangement in space of, on a facade. Um, Three-dimensional rhythm might be an architectural uh, ornamentation. And at the other end of the spectrum, um, he saw uh, mathematics as a kind of ornamentation of logical deduction. So for him, the, the, the distinction between making art and the, um, the practice of mathematical science was a kind of this axiomatic deductive structure. But he, he credited, and he gives an example of this making marks on a vase in the Stone Age. It's kind of the first theorem when somebody recognized that an alternation of marks that have to fit in symmetry around creates a grid um, and divides the surface in a regular way. He thought that's really a, should be called a theorem. Um, so the, the last thing I'll say is just since Dorothea mentioned his class, um, he taught a drawing, uh, it was called Geometry for Artists. This is uh, one drawing that I believe is in his own hand from a folder um, in the um, UT Austin has a, uh, an archive of American mathematics. Um, and it's from 1948. Uh, and here he's making a construction of an ellipse um, that's entirely um, non-metrical. Uh, There's no measurement taken. Um, and all of the whole course was like that. Um, he gave problems uh, to make constructions uh, with straight edge and sometimes with compass, um, just using these kind of really fundamental topological um, notions of adjacency um, and uh, in-betweenness. Uh, and they're, they're really stunning. So I wanted to, to, to maybe end with that. Well, my introduction to my life in mathematics is a little peculiar, like the rest of my life, I guess. Um, I had, I went, the school I went to in Montreal, uh, they taught you how to write, but they didn't teach you much mathematics because women didn't need mathematics. And I was going to École de Beaux-Arts and, and then to the Montreal Museum School, and slowly it dawned on me that most artists, many artists, including great artists like Cézanne and so on, do the same painting over and over again, or variations on it. And I, I just have a curious mind. I always have had. I thought that would... Uh, that was not the way that I could find out about myself or about art, and it, it began to it began to gel in Montreal. And there was something else that happened. That was I was painting a still life outside in, in an cl art class, and when I was through, the art teachers all you know you know thought it was wonderful, but I didn't. I thought, why does nature do it better? So this made me very ripe to go into Max's class. Um, most of the people that were there in the winter time were doing abstract expressionism, and that was painting the same painting over and over again. And not only that, it was using a vocabulary that had already been invented. And I thought the thing to do is invent your own vocabulary somehow. And wherein Max picked me up, and convinced me to go to his class. I was completely lost because 
the mathematicians in the class had come from their, their class was very small, about four or five people. And they had come from Germany to study with him, and I couldn't understand what they were talking about, and I explained that to Dr. Dane, and and he said, I will teach you mathematics for artists. Now, I didn't know this history of that he'd been doing that the whole time he was there. The other thing that was interesting to me was, and I grew up, I grew up in um, the uh, time of the Nazis, and Montreal, at a, a certain point, uh, uh, a lot of uh, Jews had escaped to England from Europe and were in Montreal. And I felt very comfortable with that culture, with the German Jewish culture. I, I, I resonated with it very much, and I didn't quite know why, but I poked around and I was finding out why. And so when I got to Black Mountain and Max took me under his arm, it, I, it was a natural for me. Now he drew on the board all the time. After we did uh, um, about six months of walks and he explained the mathematics of nature to me, then I went back into the class and I could understand it. Besides, I worked like a dog. He loaned me all kinds of books and I and helped me. I mean, I had to learn calculus and things like that. I was really starting from the beginning. I mean, I knew a smattering of algebra, but that was about it. But I, yeah, I was working into the wee hours of the morning, working on these books, and he showed me. I would ask him questions the next day, and he would direct me to answers and how to think about it. But the thing that came to me through all this was that Mathematics is emotional and it's intuitive. Now, I had a little verification for that in my life because, and it's a natural to human beings. We are nat all naturally mathematicians. Uh, when my daughter was a child, she was about, I don't know, two or three or maybe four. There were a number of people sitting in my living room, like maybe seven, something like that. And she was really little. And she picked up the right amount of jelly, bean, jelly beans from a jar and distributed them. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting that we are born with a sense of numbers? And somehow it gets knocked out of us, but we are born with this sense of how mathematics works. It's intuitive. So Max worked with me like one-on-one -on -one <laughs> a lot of hours per week. And I came uh, to New York and I struggled and I didn't know what I was doing. I was doing American painting. I copied Franz Klein and the, the artists of the day. I did my share of de Kooning and, and so on. But I knew that it was another vocabulary and not my work, not what I would do. And slowly, Oh, and then I danced at Judson Dance Theater, and there was something about dancing that uh, corroborated with my math experience. And, and I began to go back over the books I had that I'd done with Max, and so that resulted in set theory, uh, work on set theory. Now, this is a work called Set, and it's actually at Dia Beacon right now. It's been redone. It, um, I don't know, can you describe what a set is? <laughs> yeah. So um, a set is a, is a collection of things. Um, it's one of those definitions or concepts that's, that's so dumb um, <laughs> that it's hard to understand why it would be worth creating a theory around. Um, but it turns out to be a very convenient um, sort of foundation. And it happens to be the one that that Hilbert and 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 others in this drive to formalism have have used. Um, so, yeah, um, the set of people in the room um, consists of all of the elements that are uh, here uh, present, uh, and we can talk about um, the union of the set of people in this room and the people. Um, outside this room, or the intersection of the people um, 
who are artists and the people who are mathematicians or whatever. Uh, <laughs> and we can talk about subsets among uh, sets and so forth. But um, strange thing is like if, I mean, hopefully this won't happen to you. You can tell me when to stop too. So. <laughs> okay. um, hopefully soon this won't happen, but I, when I used to have this like collection of plastic bags from shopping um, under my sink that I kind of put them there and um, you can use just the nesting of sets one and mm -hmm. the other mm -hmm. in different ways to, to enumerate the, the counting numbers. Um, and so zero is the empty set and if you then take um, the set of the empty set that gives you one um, and then you kind of build up there by um, inclusion. Um, also, I want to go back a little bit to what you were saying earlier, and that is that uh, Max was part of a, a group called the Frankfurt Group, and they were studying topology. They were laying the ground rules for topology, and Poincaré was also doing that in France. I don't know that they knew about each other's work because uh, of the political difficulties that were going on, uh, but everybody is hot for topology. And when I learned about it, so was I. So while this is set theory, it's also the beginning of my understanding of topology. Go to the next one. Yeah, I should say also that the, the definition of a topology is in terms of sets. So it's this very abstract, uh, generic thing. These, these works were shown at the Bikert Gallery in, I don't know, something like 19... 71 or something like that. A Bikert Gallery was kind of an infamous gallery uh, run by Klaus Curtis, and he let the artists do anything they wanted to. It was heaven. <laughs> this is a work called uh, Either Or, and uh, the, the boards that are uh, hugging on the wall had been dipped in a pool of oil and that oil is on the paper. The paper is rolled out and the paper contains oil so that when you, it's crude oil, and when, so that when you came into the room, you saw your reflection in the oil and you could smell it. And then the boards were reflecting the pattern of their uh, penetrating the oil. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> And I think that um, you've talked about elements and trying to understand work from developing this work from an interest in the relationship among elements and wanting to see that. Um, and I, I always think it's the, this work is is so striking because the elements are given really free reign yes. to to interact and not just in relation of position but um, on a material level uh, in an irreversible way and. It's also doing other things, and that is, was not around at the time. Uh, it uses the room, in a way, as a sculptural container. And the, the topology and the crude oil is activity that's going on in relation to that sculptural container. Um, the next work I did after the topology work was is based on the golden section, and it's called Golden Section Paintings. And I just, since not everybody knows what it is, I wanted to give this illustration. If you take a square, divide it in the middle, pull a string from the center of the square to the far corner, and then pull it down without doing any algebra or anything, you get the golden mean. Um, I love this diagram that she chose and, and the way it appears here because um, so, so topologists are sometimes they call it like rubber sheet geometry because topological things um, are not changed by continuous deformation or squeezing or stretching. And um, the, just the, the slide presentation makes that square into a rectangle, um, I think, right? It's not. Yeah. But it doesn't matter um, for for the way that Dorothy is using this construction. She un, she uses the golden rectangle or golden uh, rectangle, yeah, as a as a procedure, right? I mean, the way she defined it is, 
you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this. And that, that actually is, that holds. <laughs> you can still, um, the way I learned about the golden rectangle is a solution of an algebraic equation. Um, and it's, it's hard to understand how you could get to, from that to all the work that she does, but if you understand it as an embodied process, um, and we'll, I think we'll look at work like that, then uh, you see this through line that's um, it's really fantastic. This is how other people have used it through time. And this is a golden section painting. Now, I meant you, you had suggested that I bring one of the models, and naturally I forgot. But when it, this is one sheet of linen, and it's been demarked according to the golden mean. And one side, uh, in other words, it's not two squares stuck onto each other. It's a continuous sheet. Now, a rough... Uh, a uh, description of topology is it's the study of continuous space. And I, as an artist, I sort of grabbed onto this and I was attempting it to, to do it in a studio-like manner. So the, the, I stretched this linen and it's gessoed on one side and glued on the other and then it's demarked in blue. Uh, and certain cuts have been made, but never a cut through. It's always it's always a continuous surface. And I used the blue chalk line because the pyramids in Egypt were derived from a blue chalk line, which I find fascinating. There are 10 of these in all. Let's keep going. Some of these are at D and Beacon now. Um, this work is is following the the drawing that makes itself. Is that right? Have uh, I got the, the time? The drawing or? which makes itself was really quite early. Bef it was be it, the drawing which makes itself was even before the um, set theory work. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. And the drawing which makes itself title comes from the uh, kind of a, math math a mathematical notion, which is how could a drawing be only of itself and not of something else? Because everybody was doing, making sculptures and then doing drawings of it, then you know, sort of posting them in the show as though they'd come first and they hadn't. And, and I'm just kind of deadly honest about everything in my work. And I wanted to make work that, w drawings that were only about themselves. And, and they, they're folded and they have lines on them that delineate how the folding occurred and they're opened up. Yeah, and being in the studio and seeing you unfold the model, I was just kind of blown away because I, I had, in the drawing which makes itself, there's a, you call it a Mac truck <laughs> paper. Paper. <laughs> That's like my, I, my idea was not to use uh, the fra fancy French papers that I grew up using, but to use an American paper. And I, I used a Strathmore a four ply paper, which I called the Mac truck paper. So, because <laughs> I love Mac trucks. <laughs> so the paper functions as a straight edge and a kind of compass through folding and pinning and marking on the wall, um, the these works are sort of doing that to themselves. I, I'm I'm excited about it. You can just cut me <laughs> off because there's a lot of a lot of other things going on. But one of the things that's exciting about it is, for me, is that um, then you have this interaction between the the sides and the surfaces of the piece that starts with um, and. Another thing that you really have to see, we don't have slides here because it's kind of impossible to photograph, are the carbon transfer um, drawings, which is installed um, at DIA um, really beautifully. I don't know if you could talk about that a little bit. Uh, well, um, I showed those works uh, a few years ago at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, but and Dia wanted to show them. So th again, the room is the container, and the walls uh, 
help the carbon paper to present itself in geometric forms. The, the carbon paper is folded on the diagonal and on the square, and then it's unfolded uh, according to a method. There were models made, small models made for each work. And as it's unfolded on either the square or the diagonal, a line is transferred from the uh, paper onto the wall, and that makes a, a pattern. Uh, <laughs> And so this, is, again, is using the room as a topological surface. And I find that you know, absolutely mathematical and so emotional and so beautiful as a concept. It's all coming out of Max, Max's teaching. And this is another series. Yeah. I, uh, after I finished the golden section paintings, I wanted to uh, get into my Beaux-Arts training. And so I, I've i been reading Pascal, both uh, Les Pensées de Pascal, and doing his mathematics since I was about 14. I always keep a copy of it not too far from me to this day. And of course, when you get when you fall in love with something like that and you it becomes part of your life the natural outcome is to make work and so i made the pascal paintings based on pascal and actually dia is uh, they're, they're meant to be seen in a dark room on a indigo blue wall with overall lighting but with a um a highlight on certain areas of the work and although you can't exactly pick it up from the pictures. A lot of the painting is done over gold leaf or over platinum leaf. Uh, and uh, that is Beaux-Arts somersaulting. It's very hard to do because if you make a mistake, you can't go over it because it tears the leaf. But that's what all of this is about. I, I call that the state of grace. Go back one. Sorry. I call that the state of grace because I, 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 I feel like I'm always falling on my face and, and adjusting to uh, some kind of gravity, and that's what that painting is about. But, it, but the red is painted over gold leaf. The uh, blue is painted over uh, platinum, and the gold leaf is the gold leaf. Pascal was also a radical, and he was politically uh, rebellious, totally rebellious. And uh, he was uh, working in what, the 18th century, 17th, 18th century, and he had a printing press, and he was fighting the government and the church, and he published a letter uh, once a week, and he moved the press the, move the location of the press every night. And uh, that must have taken some doing before cars and so on. And uh, finally he got caught. And I think in prison for a while, right? I can't remember exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't really remember that part of it. I have a bad memory for bad things. But his rebelliousness fascinated me. And the, as you can see, these paintings are based on topology. This is a painting that I own, which I'm going to lend to Dia. The lower red is painted over gold leaf. The upper is painted over uh, aluminum, the whole upper section of it. And, these are, and this is two panels. The lower panel is kind of like a shelf, and the top panel uh, sits on it, and uh, again, the I, I was very much thinking about mannerist painting when I did these, and I was really wanted to use old-fashioned museum lighting. Do you want to tell us about the knot theory work? Mm -hmm. Tell us about the knot theory. Works. Well. Um, I've been pestering <laughs> about knot <not> theory. <laughs> and I started studying it with Max when I was 18. Now, 
the materials don't lend themselves to actually making trefoil knots, but I'm doing, because copper doesn't bend very well, but I'm doing, um, I am making trefoil knots, but I'm taking artistic li license, and this is, I made three of these so far. And, and the, the uh, brown and the, the two browns are, and the white are on chipboard, which is paper product. And they, they hang flat against the wall. And this is the last one I made. And again, I've been bending Philip's ear about all of this stuff and tapping his knowledge and all of that all the way along. So um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the, the title for the, this conversation, which um, I sometimes people talk about the magic of, of math, and, and I feel like I've tried to do as much as possible to, to get people to not think of it as magic, that it's, <laughs> there's, there, are, there are reasons why we do the things we do. Um, but you, I, I saw something that you wrote um, in an interview that, um, that intrigued me. So in the Brooklyn Rail interview with um, Matthew Farina, you said, when one's dealing with art and mathematics, there's always an element of magic. If everything adds up or works out well, you're on the wrong trail. Is, yeah. is that the kind of what you mean by the magic? Well, what I mean in, is in, in art, if you're if you use any kind of formula, you are not being emotional. And you are not tapping the great resources that human beings, every one of us, contains. And I just, I just uh, feel that using uh, mathematical structures, ad adapting art, to mathematical structures is really an open sesame. I mean, it's much the way Cezanne used still lives. But this is, a, this is a kind of knowledge that's open for everyone, and you don't have to be a mathematician. One of the great things on YouTube right now is a whole series of professors talking uh, about not theory, and they are drawing on the board, and the thing that fascinates me completely is that they have the object that they are drawing as a linear object in their mind. And they are copying what they see in their mind. <laughs> yeah, I think there is a lot of that. And, and the, the, I feel like the carbon transfer work at DIA, mm -hmm. um, so the, the, I think you said you chose a, diff, a special white, um, so, both the, the white, walls. The white and took the scrims off the skylight right. so it's blasting white. And the floor as well. So you kind of step into the space and, and the and drawings. You're disoriented, that's the point. Yeah, you yeah. put the booties on and <laughs> you step in and, and these um, images kind of hover in the space mm -hmm. in a way that's, mm -hmm. uh, it, it feels like that platonic. <laughs> yeah, they beckon you. Um, but I think it's, I mean, it should be made clear that none of the work you're doing is illustration. No, no, um, no. I'm not in, ever interested in illustration. I want, I want the core of mathematics as I understand it. And, but my, my understanding is that of an artist doing mathematics, not like Philip, a mathematician. What do you think we should open to questions? That'd be great, yeah.